This conference will now be recorded. Good morning. All right. Sorry, just as people are joining, clicking folks off here and there. So, happy Monday, another Monday seminar, the last Monday seminar. All right. If you could please make sure that you are muted and that your video is off as well. And we will get started. So again, good morning. Welcome to our 2020 Fall EcoFoci Seminar Series. I'm Heather Tabasola. I'm one of the co-leads with Jens Nielsen, and you'll see him shortly. This seminar is part of NOAA's EcoFoci Biannual Seminar Series focused on the ecosystems of the North Pacific Ocean, Bering Sea, and U.S. Arctic. To improve understanding of ecosystem dynamics and applications of that understanding to the management of living marine resources. Since October 21st, 1986, the seminar has provided an opportunity for research scientists and practitioners to meet, present, develop their ideas and provoke conversations on subjects pertaining to fisheries oceanography. Including, and of course this includes uh, the US Arctic as well. So, you can visit the EcoFoci webpage for more information at www.ecofoci.noaa.gov. And looks like we still have folks joining us this morning. So thank you to everyone who's here. Um, as we continue this all virtual seminar series, you can find the rest of our lineup via the One NOAA seminar series and also on the NOAA PMEL calendar of events. We are here every Wednesday at 10 a.m. and except for a few occasions, today being one of them. And that is through December 16th. And then we will restart seminar next year instead. Sorry, whoever that is, can you make sure you're muted? Thank you. So please double check that your microphones are muted, that you're not using video. And during the talk, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box. Uh, Jens and I will both be monitoring the chat today. Um, and then we'll address questions with Julia at the end. Um, and with that, I'm going to let Jens jump on and he's going to introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Heather. So it's my pleasure to introduce Julia Grosse. Julia is a biological oceanographer. Um, she works a lot with understanding the cycling of organic matter and microbial food webs and generally works with phytoplankton ecology and physiology. And she approaches this work with sort of a combination of field and laboratory studies. And she uses a lot of special techniques, including compound specific stable isotopes and analyses of amino acids and carbohydrates. Uh, Julia is currently a postdoc at Geomar, Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research in Kiel, Germany. And Right now, a lot of her work focuses on the Arctic, and I'm sure that's what we'll hear about in a minute. Prior to joining um, Geoma, Julia did her PhD at NIOSH, uh, which is in Jarsika, Holland. Um, and here she studied resource limitation and biochemical composition changes in marine phytoplankton. And prior to that, Julia spent time at a couple of different places, including Georgia Tech, the Baltic Research Center in Vanamunde, and University of Rostock. Julia, thank you very much again for doing this, and I will give the virtual floor to you. Well, thank you guys for having me. Um, I hope you can all see my presentation and hear me. Good morning, good evening, good day, wherever you are. Um, I'm currently in Germany, and I will be talking about... Um, my experience in the Arctic. So um, maybe you have heard about it, the big mosaic campaign, which um, was a big endeavor that was actually planned for more than 10 years. And um, it started last year in September and then actually finished this year in October. And uh, mosaic is an acronym and it stands for Multidisciplinary Drifting Observatory for the Study of Arctic Climate. Um, the main idea was to take the research vessel Polarstern, drive it into the Arctic um, when it was still possible based on the ice situation, anchor it there on an ice floe, and then 
do just continuous measurements for an entire year. And I think this picture very well sums it all up. It was um, a beacon of light in the darkness. Um, I was uh, a participant of LEC2, which um, covered the time between um, on the on the Polarstern between the middle of December last year until the beginning of um, March this year. Um, so what was the whole motivation behind um, uh, the mosaic campaign? Well, there is rapid change in the Arctic. I guess you all have heard about the Arctic amplification, but there is a lack of observations. Lots of observations are taking place in the summer months, but there is almost no data from the winter months. Um, there have been a lot of drifting stations from the Russians, but they have been abandoned due to the ice melt. They didn't feel safe anymore. Um, there has been the Terra Ocean, the Terra Arctic in 2006 to 2008, um, and then an endeavor by the uh, Norwegians. You can see a picture there. They were there overwintering with a hovercraft. Um, yeah, but that's basically all the winter data that we have. The current model predictions are relatively poor. And of course, there is emerging operational management needs. For example, can we take the Northern Sea route instead of the existing Southern one? So those were some of the motivations. And the year-long expedition was very international. So we had more than 20 nations that participated. It was very interdisciplinary. Um, so it started out to be focused heavily on atmospheric science, but we also had teams covering ice physics, ocean physics, biogeochemistry, and then the eco ecological um, studies where I was part of. Um, it was a very multi-scale uh, expedition, so we had the ship and the central observatory based around it, um, where we did ice stations and process scale studies in, well, in our case, more like one or two kilometers away. Uh, then we had a distributed network that was set up in less than 50 kilometers around. So there were some uh, ice stations, um, lots of buoys that did ocean measurements and several weather stations uh, that were, some of them were visited frequently, um, but most of them just measured remotely and sent send data uh, via uh, satellites. And then, of course, that all came together with um, other Arctic buoy satellites. There was an airplane campaign um, that was also part of Mosaic campaign. And then we had a few, well, supposedly a few collaborating research vessels, but that was due to the pandemic not as successful as it was planned. Um, so on the on the right si side of my slide, you can actually see the cruise track uh, in gray. So we started the, the campaign started in Tromsø, Norway, in September last year, and um, the ship moved or steamed all the way um, into into the ice. They were looking around for a flow, uh, and once they had one, um, they just anchored it, and the ship started drifting. Um, to, so the first leg, like, which was the first two months, did about this little piece here. Uh, then the second leg, we came and we did something like this part. Um, then the third leg arrived in March, and they actually went all the way down here in three months. And then due to the pandemic, the uh, icebreakers to resupply people and, and um, other supplies, they couldn't actually get there. Uh, so Polarstein had to leave the flow behind. They moved, uh, they went to Svalbard, exchanged people. And then you can see this little green, uh, little gray track here is actually where the, sh where the ice flow basically moved itself within this uh, two or three weeks that it was abandoned. Um, then the ship returned back for the fourth leg here in blue um, and measured as much as they could until the flow actually broke apart. Uh, in, in early July, they recovered lots of the distributed network and then decided to head back north. So that's this other gray transit, oops, um, up north via the North Pole uh, to get back and investigate a few more freezing processes. 
um, before in late September they actually packed up, moved back all the way to Bremerhaven and um, yeah, the, the expedition was finished. And before I get into, into my lag, the, the winter lag, I just want to show you one more picture um, from the mosaic uh, track. And this is actually the North Pole, how it was in early August this year. So it was not covered completely nice anymore. They were there in just five or six days. And I think it's a very impressive and very sad picture. But now let's go back to just the expedition itself. It started in Norway with a big media and um, farewell party, lots of people giving speeches. Um, and then Ulaschen left Tromsø together with the academic Fedorov, which is a research icebreaker from the Russians. And they headed out to find the flow. Um, it was very difficult in the end. They only had like one suitable flow that was thick enough to enter or to, to um, use. Um, and the Fedorov was also there. So, so this is what they did. They went on different ice flows, checked the, the, the thickness, which was I think like 60 centimeters or less. Um, so that's not a flow you want to put a lot of equipment on. Um, but then once they found their suitable uh, flow, they, they were unpacking. So you can see here parts of the meteorological tower. Um, then in the back, a power supply. Someone always had to be on bear guard watch. And they spent the first three, four weeks to just set up the camp and get it um, into operational mode. Um, while the, the Fedorov was driving around setting up this distributed network, and they also had a summer summer school um, on board with uh, some early career scientists and lots of media attention, of course. Um, yeah, and, and they were starting to get the measurements, the continuous measurements started in uh, the end of October and they were measuring until mid-December, but we already had to arrive in Tromsø in the end of November. Uh, so there we had two days of safety training. Uh, here you can see uh, how we had to jump into the, the fjord there and use and try our ice picks to get on that board. And I tell you, those suits are not uh, leak tight. So it's very cold. Uh, so yeah, the two days included uh, also how to set up all the emergency equipment that we had, like tents and stoves and everything else, um, how to use the uh, uh, radio, uh, how to communicate over radio and how to escape from a, a helicopter in case it has to do an emergency water landing. Um, and of course, we, we got about two big bags full of clothes that we were wearing during the, during the expedition. Um, then we boarded the Kapitan Dranitsin, which is a Russian coastal icebreaker. And you can see this picture was taken at about 10 in the morning, and this was as bright as it got. So even by then, the sun didn't even um, rise above the mountains. Um, yeah, and that would be our home for the next three weeks. Uh, that was the estimated time that it would take us to get to the Polarshen. And well, for the first five days, we actually anchored in the Fjord of Tromsø due to bad weather. But uh, it was also an opportunity to see the Northern Lights, which was really beautiful. Um, and then we set out across the Barren Sea. And at that point, the sun, like it was basically dark. And uh, we met the first ice and we just followed our searchlights. and. Yeah, already started to experience the continuous darkness. Um, then we finally arrived um, right on schedule. We could park right next to the Polarshen. And interesting or, or cool to see. So the, um, you can see the, the black line here is our fuel line. So we were pumping uh, diesel. Uh, you can see the anchor lines, which um, anchored the ship to the ice flow. 
And you can see this little hut over here, which is um, the stern bear guard watch. So the ship had a system, like an infrared system to monitor for polar bears, but due to the position of the chimney, it did not cover the stern. So someone had to do two hour shifts in the back there. We had a great logistics team um, to make sure there's no polar bears coming from, the, from this part. Right, so I was part of the team ECO and usually when I go on a cruise, uh, I have like one or two main responsibilities and this just repeats itself over and over. You just try to finish up one station before you hit the next one. Um, but on this cruise, it was completely different. Uh, so the, the team was structured in a way that everyone had their own research project. Um, there was time allocated for taking care of that. But we also sampled a lot of core parameters, just like you know, nutrients and POC, DOC, all those um, parameters that we all need to interpret our data. Um, and that actually included also for the oceanographers to go onto the ice and do some ice core drilling. So that was our Monday schedule. Um, on Tuesday, we went to Ocean City to sample a shallow SCDD down to 250-ish meters. And um, <coughs> uh, so the little blue tent in the corner up here, this is Ocean City. So we had also a balloon town and a met city, but actually it was just little tiny huts or tents like that. Um, the round image on the top is actually uh, the inside of that Ocean City tent, so we could fit a few people in, but not much more. Um, so we took sam we obtained samples from there. On Wednesday, we had to process the ice cores that were melting on Tuesday. Um, they had to be like the water um, had to be sub parsed, and then we also mainly filtered for a lot of different parameters. Um, we had two days for CDDs to the ocean floor and for nets, so uh, multi-nets and uh, ring nets and those kind of things. Um, but due to the safety drills that the crew had to do every Friday, um, Friday was cut kind of short. So we had Saturday as a backup day. But Saturdays was also like uh, ROV nets, um, like seen on the on the right. And we also had a project that was uh, looking at fish. Uh, so they would set out long lines once or twice a week. Um, and uh, yeah, we didn't catch a single fish. And then Sunday was not a day off. We did data entry uh, preparation for the next week and lots of team meetings. And um, so this was my fourth uh, expedition on Polastia. We usually do summer cruises in the Fram Strait between Greenland and Svalbard. And what happens there is that we get a call that says like, okay, CDD is on deck in 20 minutes, and then you'll just show up in the CDD hangar and get your water. Um, this time it was a lot different. Um, instead of requiring like two people from the deck's crew, one on deck and one up in the winch room. We had like six of them helping us out. And we had to be three people from the science department on deck, as well as three people or four people on the ice. And the reason was that we didn't have the lighting bar, which puts the CDD right next to the ship into the water. Um, but there was a lot of ice buildup. So it would have required to drill like a four or five meter hole. Uh, to get the CDD in, so they decided to put a hole like five meters away from the ship <coughs> and use that as the CDD hole. And to do that, we actually had to put the winch on the crane and then um, get the CDD into the water that way. So that already required two people from the deck's crew just to coordinately um, drive those two machines. Uh, and then we had to cover the CDD with this nice red cover that had a blowing, like a hot or warm air tube going into it to make sure that none of the sensors froze before we got it in and out of the water. Um, and then we had the people on the ice that received the CDD. We had to make sure that 
the frame of the red cover was on those wooden planks instead of going into the water, but that the CDD went into the water. And um, yeah, so that took, if we were good, like half an hour to just get the CDD in or out. And uh, then the cover would be put on like the little heater that you can see there. And um, when we got to the flow in December and took it over from the like one people, they just had it covered by this wooden plank. And we very quickly realized that it would take us an incredible amount of time and manpower to just keep the hole open. Um, so we had heavy equipment like chainsaws and stuff like that. But um, in the end, we decided to put a tent over it and heat it up to just about above freezing um, to keep the hole open and the time we spent on cleaning it very minimal. And that worked out pretty well, actually. Um, yeah, and then on the way back, uh, the CDD had to be accompanied, like it got out of the cover and we had to actually have hot air blow on it so the, the sensors wouldn't freeze. Um, we still had problems with the nozzles being frozen, so no water would come out. It took a while. Um, you can see then the, our tent solution there on the right. And another problem we had was that the CDD on Polarstern would not be uh, working when the temperatures outside was below minus 30 degrees, which was uh, an insurance issue. So it would have still worked below th minus 30, but they didn't allow us to use it. Um, just to give you a brief overview on like that we actually measured something that there are some results. Uh, I plotted the salinity and the temperature. And um, I will come to the I will come to the temperatures once again later. Um, so you can see our drift plot how we drifted further north, and then um, it's a it's a time axis there for temperature and uh, salinity. And yeah, you can basically see that it's a low salinity in the upper 30 or so meters, and very low temperatures in the upper 80 or so meters. And then a very specific feature that we found was like this thermal maximum at about 230, 250, and then later weakening to 270 meters. And that's actually the temperature maximum of the Atlantic water that flows into the uh, Central Arctic Ocean. Um, so I myself was also responsible for bacteria biomass production, so for the radioactive band, and um, yeah, so that's what we measured right on board. And it's just crude data, but we could measure something. The rates were a lot lower than what we usually find in the front strait, but at least we could, there is bacterial activity there in the midst of the winter, and also all the way down to about 100 meters. Um, we also had a lot of net toes, and so we found a lot of uh, high biodiversity, um, jellyfish, some copepods, uh, other crustaceans, and you can actually see the, the net, uh, uh, what, how much was in the nets on like those pictures. So it was actually a lot, and they were, they were feeding, they were reproducing, they were happily swimming around and very active actually. That's, that's actually something that we didn't actually expect. Um, then of course we had Christmas. Um, I don't know if any of you ever had spent time like Christmas on a research vessel. Um, it was uh, still a working day, but we had a nice uh, reception by the captain and the officers, lots of good food, secret centers, and um, yeah, it was actually some fun time too. Um, and then we had lots of activity on the ice. So uh, something that we didn't expect, um, we had a lot of lead openings. So here you can already see how it's uh, freezing over again and all the frost flowers. And um, we took this opportunity to also do some experiments and measurements on like how the needs are actually freezing over again. For example, those are the physical oceanographers 
and they're actually having a CDD on a fishing rope uh, on one of those leads. And um, yeah. Um, what also happened with this ice activity is here you can see the lead on the on the right, uh, the mosquito on the left, and then the mosquito tracks that we made like a day before. And you can see how the ice just pushed over it and um, piled up pressure uh, ridges. And um, yeah, actually there was an incident where we were trapped on on the other side of the lead and everything was deforming. So we actually had to climb a few of us over one of those building up pressure ridges. Um, yeah, this was another lead that was opening. It was about 200 meters wide. And uh, in case you're wondering, this is our helicopter. The exposure time is just so long. Um, that was flying by and there's still lots of open water. And the problem with this one was that it shifted our second year ice site by about 800 meters and it took a week to get access again to it. Um, so yeah, there was also weeks where we didn't have to do ice coring because we couldn't access the ice core site. <coughs> um, this is a, um, a infrared uh, picture from the helicopter and Mac in the middle here is the Polarstern. And then you can see our little emergency runway that we constructed. And all the yellow and slightly orange parts is like open water. And um, oops, I think this one over here is the lead that I just showed you. So there was massive movement in the ice during those few days. Um, yeah. Charismatic megafauna, everyone wonders about that. We had polar bear guards all the time. Um, like each group that was outside had to have one with a rifle. Uh, and during working hours outside, some like one person from the science team had to be on the bridge and uh, just watching around, making sure there's no polar bear. Um, but we were not, well, I guess not very lucky in that case that we saw a polar bear. Uh, we only had visited a uh, visit from this one. And uh, he was actually so shy that he only showed up on this one picture, uh, which is our remote sensing site. So equipment that is usually installed on satellites. And um, so the person responsible for that site, he was just looking at the data in the morning. It was like something is off. So he went back to those pictures and we figured out what happened to uh, the equipment. Uh, the bear didn't actually break anything. He just shifted one of the equipment and uh, he didn't trip over any wires. He just stepped over it. So it was a very cautious polar bear. And of course, everyone's sad that we didn't see it, him or her. Um, someone who was giving us trouble was this little guy. Um, very cute, but um, yeah, maybe you can see the little blue back on, on the white fur. This is not actually a problem with the picture. This is a piece of our data cable that he chewed through. So he was copy, causing some problems um, just chewing on cables. And a huge group of us spent an entire morning outside and just wiping all the cables. We had all the data cables and all the electricity cables the diesel to make sure that maybe he doesn't bite any more cables. And then, yeah, all the cable, the data cable, the broken data cable had to be brought back to the ship and repaired and then taken back out, taken back out which was of course a, a massive undertaking. Um, yeah, it was very cold. So this is what people look like after being outside for two hours. Um, and yeah, it was dark and it was cold and Every once in a while, we got this message, devices approaching minimum aberration temperature uh, will turn off because it's too cold. Uh, the average temperature was minus 26 degrees C or minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the temperature range was pretty significant from like minus or from like 15.3 Fahrenheit to minus 36.8 Fahrenheit. Um, and this was not just the highest and the lowest, but we also saw 
massive changes in temperatures within just a few hours. So from like minus 10 to my, from 15 to like minus 25 in just a few hours, which of course impacted our CDD working time. Uh, so there was a few days where we just had to sit around and wait and hope that the number on the screen went up. Um, and you can see like uh, a screenshot from from the ship uh, there it was minus 37.8 degrees Celsius. But of course, at a wind speed of 10 meters per second, we got the wind chill temperature and that was actually minus 71. So it was very cold, just to sum it up. Um, what was also interesting with the temperature was that um, the ship measurements were done next to the helicopter hangar at like 20 meters or so height. Um, but sometimes it was colder on the ice. So there was a big debate then, which temperature do we take to the side if we, if we launch the CDD or not, or should we get it out of the water now? Or so what shall we do? And I'm glad I wasn't the one who had to make the decision. Um, yeah, so this is our drift track. Um, you can see the little dots, it's like one dot per day. And um, the colors actually uh, reflect the speed that we had, uh, that we were drifting. And um, yeah, the, the big straight line, we actually started drifting in a straight line north about the time that the like three people left Tromsø. Um, and that was significant because they had a hard time catching up with us. And this is also where we reached the furthest northern point at 88 degrees north and 36 seconds, a uh, minute, sorry. Um, and then you can see, yeah, the, the gray line is the Terra drift from 2007. And you can see how the drift usually does like little loops and circles. Um, just to put that in numbers, uh, the total drift drag was like 336 nautical miles in 12 weeks. Uh, the net distance was only 219 nautical miles due to those loops and circles. And we set the new world record for the northernmost drifting vessel in winter. And it was only 84 nautical miles from the North Pole. And if we could have decided on the three people, to go on the helicopter, uh, we would have probably taken a flight up there or not. Um, yeah, so the, the like three people were supposed to come in mid-February and relieve us. And that was their planned route. And this picture, you can already see um, how broken up and the ice was, at least in the south, um, and that there were massive leads leading up to us in north. Um, this is just the the Kapitän Dranitsin, so they, they were um, supposed to come back and relieve us, and each dot represents like one hour. And you can see that sometimes they just didn't they just didn't make any progress at all. Um, and also what you can see on this picture very nicely is all those big leads that were unfortunately going in the wrong direction. Um, so they, they were hoping for a super highway to come and pick us up, but it wasn't there. Um, and then of course, um, so it took them longer and longer to try and catch up. So every night we would wait for the graphs um, representing the fuel issue. Uh, you can see how the fuel consumption in the beginning of the plot, the red and blue lines, um, is like relatively low. And then once they hit, the ice, they were increasing the fuel consumption. Um, but then on like day five and six, like the distance that they traveled decreased more and more and more. Uh, they even had to take a break or so um, because the pressure was too high and they wouldn't have gotten anywhere. Um, and the, the right graph actually shows the volume of fuel that they still have left. So by the time we got this graph, they already had run out of heavy fuel and the, the remaining total very much uh, went towards the 50-50 line. So which was of course a problem for us because we assumed that we would need at least half the fuel to return back to Tromsø. Uh, we haven't even talked about the, the food issue because they were already 
two weeks longer on their approach from a total of six weeks. Um, it took them already five weeks to get there. So we weren't even thinking about how much food they would leave for us for the return trip. And we would have to assume that our return trip takes as long as their trip to get to us. So that was very uncertain times, but they finally made it on the day that um, we could actually see the horizon again. Um, they had a park about 800 meters away. It was still minus 40 degrees Celsius Fahrenheit. Um, and they started with the piston bullies to exchange um, all the gear, uh, which took about a week. And then we finally moved over and um, returned or made our return journey. Um, when the, like three people took over, they had about three weeks of science planned uh, due to their delay. And they were supposed to fly out in the beginning of April. And due to the pandemic, they actually came home in like mid-June. So they, yeah, they didn't bargain for that either. Um, so we we took the Rani team back south. Um, we finally saw the sun again uh, coming over the horizon. There were still lots of ice ridges and some of our progress was slow, uh, but we were lucky to find some of those super leads. So every once in a while for an hour or two, we could go like six, seven knots, um, which was pretty cool. And we saw our polar bear. So that was the leg two polar bear. Um, the Russians actually stopped the ship. So he could come close. And I think we have like a million of those uh, pictures from that one polar bear compared to the one picture of the of the ice camp polar bear. Um, then of course, as I said, we had a fuel problem. So in the middle of nowhere in the high Arctic, we met a second Russian icebreaker for about a week to pump some heavy fuel to make it back to Tromsø. Um, they also gave us some food. And then due to the pandemic, we had to do more or less uh, Russian issued quarantine for two weeks before they actually let us go to Tromsø. By that time, we were still allowed to get into the part of Tromsø. And because of all the air, uh, um, airports that had closed down, the AVI actually gave us a charter flight to Germany, which was very nice, especially two thirds of the people were German. So all we had to do is say, take a train or car home. And um, the international people also made it home. So, and with that, I just want to thank you again for being here and thank the Mosaic team for such a great time and I'm open for your questions. Oh my goodness. Wow, Julia, thank you so much for sharing all that. Really, I love this nice picture here too. Uh, who, could guys say Hello. that you've uh, muted your, unless that's you, Jens, sorry. It wasn't me. <laughs> I think <laughs> call it one. I can't, they're not, sorry, I'm scrolling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, there we are. Call okay. it too. Uh, Jens, can you put on your video? Do you have video? I do. I thought I did put it on. Here we go. All right, Jens, All right. this is really Q&A today, so. Yeah, thank you very much, Julia. Everybody, please put in questions in the chat um, while we wait for that. I can start with one. Uh, you showed that picture of, you, you called it the sad Arctic North, North Pole. There was, I, I assume you meant very little ice. Yeah. At this point, I guess a lot of data is still being uh, analyzed, but are there sort of some some big takeaways from, from the expedition that, that really stands out to you or, or, the, or the team? Uh, changes in ice or uh, things you, you know, both in the context of climate, but also just sort of, are the things that you really didn't expect or so i think we didn't expect as much ice movement and lead opening as we had so we had people from the sheba expedition was like 20 years ago they were like yeah yeah there's like we had one lead and it froze over but we had continuously lead openings 
And uh, so the temperature of the ocean underneath is like minus 1.7 degrees or something. So about 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And the temperature, like the air temperature is much uh, lower. So there was a lot of um, sea fog, I guess you call it, coming out. And um, so the atmospheric people said that this is gonna do a huge, has a huge impact on the, on the energy budget. Uh, from an ecological standpoint, well, we saw that everything is kind of dormant and sleeping and not much is going on, but we did actually find um, activity, bacterial activity, the zooplankton activity. We did see a seal go to the North Pole. Um, we did also see polar plant. We didn't catch any, but there was still life up there. Um, yeah. And I think like they had, like there was a lot of models beforehand that predicted our drift corridor, but also how fast we would drift. And I think no one expected us to drift as fast as we did. So by the time that we left the floor in March, uh, we were already across the predicted line for May. So the ice is drifting much faster. Right. Thanks. And we have a couple of questions. Heather asks, um, What's the one thing you wish you packed but didn't, and vice versa, the one thing you packed but didn't need at all? Oh, the, the, what I shouldn't, like, I could have packed a lot less clothes, so the, the Avi, they gave us huge duffel bags, and I wouldn't have needed all the sweaters that I took. And the thing that I wish I packed, oh, that's a tricky one, because I've been, I've been there so many times, so I had my own laundry. Uh, line to hang my clothes because it's very dry air. So if you put your laundry out there, you have nice breathable air. Um, and of course, we already got um, emails from the people on board telling us what we should bring. So like two days before we left Tomsø, they were like, bring more hand and foot warmers. So a bunch of us were like, okay, where do we get hand and foot warmers in Tomsø? So we bought like all the supplies of that in, from one of those stores. Yeah. Thanks. We got another question here from Kyle. It says most of the aerial pictures were taken by drones, helicopter, airplanes, etc. If the drone was used, any difficulty operating in cold temperatures? Um. Probably. I I don't know. That was um. So we had um a camera crew with us. Um. They were they were using those drones. I don't think they had problems flying it, there might have been like an optics problem. I know that the helicopters had problem at very low temperatures. Um, I think the chief pilot was like, we don't really want to fly below minus 35 degrees C. And um, like all the drone scientific work was only happening on like three, four and five because of the darkness. Right. And then it was uh warmer. Yeah, uh, let's see here. We got one from Colleen. She says, wow, what an adventure. Seemed kind of touch and go with the fuel, food, and crew change delays. Did you feel safe? Yeah, we, we definitely felt safe. So they had already plan B and C and D uh, from the beginning. Uh, at that point, it was kind of like figuring out which, which plan to run. Um, and of course, you can always improve communication. So for us, it was like uncertainty rather than not feeling safe. And we did have enough food and toilet paper, which was something on the way from Tromsø to the Polarstern that was, actually, if we would not have spent five days in the fjord, we might have run out of that one. <laughs> right. And I've got one here from Laurie that was sent to me. Um, maybe you mentioned this, but how big was the ship? So I'm assuming the Prolastan. How many scientists are on board and how many crew? For oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So they, they reduced the, the crew a little bit for, for the drift because we were not steaming. Um, usually it's like 45 uh, ship's crew and 55 um, science crew. But that also includes the German Weather Service and the helicopter pilot. And this time it was like 60 science crew and about 40 for the production crew. 
Right. And here's one from John Martin. Was the Northern Light display continuous or just intermittent? Um, so I, I figured that the Northern Lights look much better on pictures than they do in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so, was it a common was it a common occurrence sort of throughout uh, your so so we saw them in Tromsø and also on the way back and forth but um to see them on Polarstern we were actually too far north to see them um there was one occurrence where we did see where we did see them which was actually a five minute discussion if there are clouds or northern lights or what the hell is going on um, so someone would take out the camera and take a picture and we'll check if it's green. But yeah, we were actually too far north to see them there. Right. Um, I want to circle a little bit back to the size of the ship. So I remember reading Ernest Shackleton's sort of famous book about, I think his ship is called the Endurance, if I remember correctly, where they basically get stuck in the ice. They don't plan to and the whole ship gets crushed. I am assume, well, I know Polashtan is much bigger, but was there any measures or concerns about you know the movement of the ice and pressure building up even for a ship that size or or is it not not a worry no no this is this is not a concern at all because it's a it's an icebreaker so that's what it does i was told mm -hmm. it can break ice up to eight meters or something um right. so that was like we felt shifts like like the 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 ice would just move underneath the ship and lift the ship up so that's based on the construction of the ship. Um, the only worry that we and the, the leg after us had was the anchor lines. So if you put too much tension on them, then they might snap and that could be dangerous. So I think they actually had that on leg three when it was so much ice movement that uh, one of the anchor lines actually snapped. Uh, we got another question here from Alan Mearns. He says, are there any ice islands up there these days, like in the 1960s? Are you mean the Russians? Yeah, they used to have those drifting camps, I think until like the early 2000s. But then they also realized that they're melting and they abandoned the idea. I think they are um, also looking into like uh, pontoons or whatever they're called, like those floating ship kind of things. So basically a Russian military. All right. Thank you, Julia. Um, I don't see an, oh, there was one here. Sean says, were there any signs of humanity further north than you expected? Uh, no, we didn't, we didn't see any human impact. I mean, it's like, snow covered ice over an ocean. Um, we did do some sample takings for microplastics so, and that kind of thing, but I don't, I don't know what the results are. Um, I know that we were more than a thousand miles away from the nearest settlement and the closest human beings were the people on the ISS actually. I think they're only 400 miles or something. <laughs> And Heather asked, what is your favorite memory from the trip? Um, oh, there are many. So um, because the science was so diverse, I was also looking into an atmospheric science. So I was doing, I was, I was allowed to drive a ski doo around. That was pretty cool. Um, and my niece was born during that time. So I, I actually um, made her her own radio sound and launched her own weather balloon. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> That's great. Uh, let's see, I, I, I'm gonna limit this to two um, more. So I think Brian asked, what was the major scientific take homes? We already kind of covered that uh, in my first yeah. question, I think. It's going to take uh, like, oh, you wanna, okay, go ahead. No, go ahead, if, if you have anything to add, please. Uh, oh yeah, no. So it's it's probably gonna take a decade or so to to work through all this data and publish papers. And just maybe of interest for you is that um, all the data will be publicly available, I think, in 2023. So we have to 
all publish our data in repositories by then and then you're free to to also use the data okay. and yeah we're still analyzing samples we'll take one from john martin which is very quick and then i will finish with one from laurie uh right camp so john just asked was there much snowfall when you were there uh yeah we had a few storms and uh there was a snow team um and there was quite a bit of snowfall and there was also a lot of snow drift. okay and then last one from laurie here says you mentioned that there were no fish caught given the amount of zooplankton uh that seems a bit or if that was maybe surprising, um, wrong bait, or just sort of poor luck, or weren't there any at all? And were there any eDNA samples taken to sort of assess that? Yeah, we took a lot of DNA samples um, mm -hmm. to answer that question. There were fish, so on the ROV's uh, camera footage, we could see little um, polar cod swimming around. Uh, they probably ate the zooplankton. And we also saw a seal, so they probably ate the fish. But uh, yeah, I guess they were just using the wrong bait. I don't know. It's a study to assess how much, if it makes any sense to fish the Central Arctic. So if we can now say that there is no fish in the Central Arctic, that might be a reason. I don't know. That's just yeah. speculation from my side. But yeah, I, I, that was not my pro project. I can't say anything about the bait. We'll have to wait to 2024 or whenever the data gets Actually, out. Actually, we, we already have a paper in review that uh, deals with the fish. So on the lag before us, they were catching Atlantic cod, actually. So I think in total, they had two fish that they caught. And there is a paper in press or in, in, review, in, in review. OK. Thank you very much. And I thank everybody for asking questions. We are very close to the 11 o'clock. So uh, yeah. happy. Thanksgiving, everybody. And um, I'm just sorry, and I'll, I'll close out. Julia, thank you so much. Um, and just remember, everybody will be back here on Wednesday, December 2nd, with Kimberly Aiken, who's a potential PhD candidate at the Arctic University of Norway. Um, and she'll be discussing amplifying diverse voices, advocacy for the protection and integration of Arctic indigenous culture, language, and knowledge in science and policy. And if you've missed one of our seminars or you'd like to re-watch the seminar today, you can use those ones on PMEL's YouTube page under the Ecofoci Seminars. Uh, these usually take about two weeks to get up, two weeks depending on how fast we can review them. So please double check back there as well. And those are also listed in the OneNOAA um, calendar events. You can find that link there. And Julia, again, thank you so, so much for joining us. What an experience, experience you you had. I can't imagine being stuck um, in ice on a boat, but um, your pictures definitely took us there for a little bit, and that was really, really awesome. So thank you for sharing that with us, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Everyone have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Like Jens said, Jens, thanks for doing the Q&A and intro today, and we will see everybody here back next week. Bye, everyone.